Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome Kamalika Chaudhary to our seminar series. Kamalika received her Bachelor of Technology degree in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur and after the, in computer science. And then she came to UC Berkeley, where she did her PhD. And then since she's been on the faculty of uh, UC San Diego uh, in the computer science and engineering department, Kamrika's research contributions are over a very broad span of machine learning and, and uh, statistical learning. She's made contributions to differential privacy, to learning from sensitive data with privacy, learning under sampling bias in the presence of an adversary. And all these fall under the category of trustworthy machine learning. And in the area of learning theory, she's worked on clustering, uh, active and interactive learning, online methods, and non-parametric learning, which is going to be the topic of today's talk. And so uh, we, in turn, look forward to learning from Kamalika. So Kamalika, over to you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, you know, I um, I'm also very glad about the format of the seminar because I haven't done this kind of thing for um, you know research work in a long time. So I'm very excited to give a talk uh, without slides on the whiteboard. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Very good. We are looking forward to it. Okay, so uh, what I would be talking about today is, uh, you know, uh, basically adversarially uh, robust uh, classification. Um, so what do I mean by adversarial robustness? Well, um, adversarial robustness has been, uh, you know, in a, uh, um, it's, it's been, it's received quite a bit of attention le lately. And uh, so an example would be, uh, many of you may have seen this demo on the internet where there's an image of a panda and it gets perturbed by a really tiny bit. Uh, you know, if you look at the perturbation, it looks like noise. And, uh, and then, you know, to the human eye, the perturbed image also looks like a panda. But apparently, if you have a neural network classifier, uh, all the state-of-the-art neural network classifiers would be highly confident that it's something else, right? So they think it's a monkey, whereas uh, it continues to be a panda. Right, and it's a, a kind of a bit of a mystery in the sense that you know why is this happening? Uh, what's going on over here? Uh, do we expect this to happen everywhere? Um, and that's kind of uh, going to be the uh, topic of my talk. And you know, um, as a theoretician, I'm going to kind of look at it from um, a bit of a you know a bit of a theoretical angle. We'll try to formalize um, a, a framework, you know. Uh, for uh, for this uh, for these uh, phenomena, and then we will try to prove some results about what uh, what happens, uh, what what is really going on, right? Why are we seeing these kinds of things? Okay, so uh, here is the setting that we'll be talking about, uh, and this is kind of the standard machine learning setting, the standard setting that we look at in learning theory. Uh, the problem we will be looking at is classification. Um, so what is classification? In classification, what happens is that we are given um, a bunch of XI, YI pairs. Um, you know, these are um, our uh, training data. So this is what is called the training data. And uh, XIs are, you know, what are known as feature vectors. Um, and this is, you know, this is, of course, kind of an abstraction of, uh, of real data. And YIs are what are known as uh, labels, right? So these are discrete labels. So examples would be XI could be, you could have, let's say, uh, you know, um, an image of a cat, uh, because as you know, a lot of machine learners like to do cat classification. So, you know, you have the image of the cat. Uh, and what you could do is you convert this image to a vector, right? So you could convert it to a vector of pixel colors or, you know, uh, or something else. And the YI would be the label that this is a cat, right? So it's a categorical label. Uh, and the goal is to find the rule that will predict the y's from the x's, right? So um, find the rule to uh, rule. So I'm going to call this rule f to predict uh, y from x's, right? Um, Okay, so these are, uh, so this is kind of the, uh, you know, so this is kind of the uh, setting. And for most of the talk, I will uh, talk about Y's that are binary, right? So for example, uh, these could be, you know, you could be classifying cat versus dog, or you could, keep, you could be classifying spam emails versus non-spam emails, and so on and so forth. 
okay um, so what does the uh, so so this is the this is our task and in machine learning or rather in learning theory most of uh, what we do is in what is called the statistical learning framework okay so what is the statistical learning framework what the statistical learning framework does is that it says that there is an underlying data distribution d right so there is an underlying data distribution d and this d is over um, you know the space of all feature vectors times the space of all labels right so imagine uh, so the space of all feature vectors could be you know all possible images and then if we are trying to uh, you know classify let's just say cats versus dogs then that could be why could be you know cat and dog right uh, and uh, and the point of you know having this distribution is that your all your data right so your training data so the training data is the data that you are using to build the classifier and test data is the data that you're using to evaluate the classifier so training and test data these are all iid samples from this distribution d okay so these are all iid samples that are drawn from d okay so uh, what is uh, so you know so this is fine so what are we hoping for when we uh, when we want to fit uh, this rule right well in the standard machine learning uh, you know in the standard statistical learning framework what we are looking for is high accuracy right so the goal is uh, high accuracy so uh, what is accuracy well uh, the accuracy of a classifier f so i'm going to use this notation acc with respect to d the accuracy of a classifier f is the probability uh, where uh, feature label pairs are drawn from this data distribution d f of x is equal to y right so this is the fraction of times uh, f is going to predict the right label according to the distribution okay so this is uh, you know our basic statistical learning framework right so i'm just going to um, kind of um, i'm just going to kind of um, you know because we might come back to this okay so i'm just going to circle this in red okay right so the accuracy itself is not enough what we need is a bit more machinery so we say that our classifier robust so um, for robustness we need a few uh, definitions we say that f is robust uh, at a point x at uh, a point x uh, with a radius r right it is robust at a point x with radius r if f of x is equal to f of x prime for all x prime in a ball of radius uh, r around x right and you know here uh, you uh, must uh, you know i mean you must uh, you know i mean here uh, you must be wondering uh, where you know this ball comes from so so basically your robustness it with respect to some underlying metric right so now you know in addition to having a data distribution we also have some metric that is uh, on the uh, feature vectors and what we are saying is that uh, you know you are uh, our classifier is robust at a point point x if um, it's uh, it's uh, you know if it is uh, if it predicts the same thing in a ball of radius uh, r around x right so if you know if x is the point is this point over here then this uh, this particular classifier so this is a linear classifier right so it it's um, it predicts one on this side and um, you know plus one on this side and minus one on this other this classifier is going to be robust with radius r at x because this x is distance r away from its decision boundary right so decision boundary is where it's changing its predictions okay uh, with radius s uh, so one thing that uh, might occur to you is it's actually easy to have the perfectly robust classifier if you just predict the same thing all the time right so you could always say this is a cat and you know your classifier is absolutely perfectly robust so but it's also absolutely perfectly useless so what you want to do is you want to somehow balance robustness and accuracy okay uh, 
So, uh, so we do that through a measure that uh, that we called uh, call astuteness, and it's kind of a combination of robustness and accuracy, right? So the astuteness, um, I'm going to write down this definition. So the astuteness, I'm going to call it AST of a classifier with respect to a data distribution D and radius R. Um, of this classifier F is the following. This is the probability where X and Y are being drawn from the underlying distribution D, F of X equal to Y, right? If I only cared about accuracy, this is where I would stop, but I don't. I say that, and also F of X, I'm going to erase this part a little bit just so that, uh, you know, just so that, um, you can see f of x is equal to f of x prime for all x prime in the ball of radius r around x, right? So what I want uh, uh, is the fraction according to the data distribution where the classifier is accurate as well as it is robust, right? So it's not too close to the decision boundary. It's going to predict the right thing and it's going to be, um, you know, at least distance R away from the decision boundary, right? So the picture you should be thinking of uh, is something like this. So this is called um, astuteness. Let me also write this down. So this is called astuteness. So the picture that should be in your mind is something like this, right? So let's say, um, you know, so let's say my data kind of looks like this. So the cats are maybe over here and the dogs are, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, kind of over here and they don't need to be circles. They could look arbitrary. Uh, and the, the uh, I astute classifier that I'm looking at would be something like this, right? This is this black one would be an astute classifier, whereas this could be, you know, an accurate but a non-astute classifier, right? So the purple one passes very close to the dogs. So this could be an accurate, uh, this would still be accurate, but it would not be robust and accurate, whereas uh, what we are looking for is something like the black one, right? Which is both robust and accurate. Okay. Uh, so that's the question. Yes. Ms. Prakash. Hi. Hi. Uh, the, the last thing you wrote, the astuteness. Now that's a probability. So x, y, and x prime are random variables here, right? Yes. Uh, you have a joint distribution of on x and y, and now you need to write a, a the probability of an event that involves x, x prime, and y, right? Right. Uh, how do you get the distribution of X prime? Uh, what is so the here X prime? That's an excellent question. So X prime is actually for all. X prime is not a random variable. Okay, all right. Once you know X prime, you just want the entire ball to be all on right. one side. So it's only X and Y that are random here. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Right. So can, I, can I ask a clarifying question also? Also, are, are yeah. you not willing to assume that your, uh, that your X, Y pairs are consistent with some function? Um, we haven't assumed that yet. Uh, so we'll be mostly talking about non-parametric uh, cases. So we, we haven't assumed it. Uh, so we, we won't be. But in some okay. cases, you could assume it. I okay. agree. Yeah. And, I, and I guess another question, I guess, while we're here, I mean, you, the way you do your picture, you have a lot of spaces in the middle that are not classified as anything. Are those just assumed to occur with probability, very low probability under D? Or are they, or are they, can, they can be classified either way or it doesn't matter? So the, uh, that's again an excellent question. So I drew that picture for a purpose. Uh, so here what is happening is that the support is the, uh, maybe let me uh, color the support just to make sure, you know. This is the support of the, uh, of the cats and this uh, is the support of the dogs. Um, and uh, we will also talk about when that is not the case. And the reason why I am purposely looking at this, and I'll, I'll come to it in just a minute, uh, at these kinds of distributions is these are the kinds of distributions where there is no robustness accuracy trade-off. So... Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know what you mean by this is the type, but, uh, but I'll let you continue and then see. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll come to a slightly formal okay. definition in a bit, but okay. that's why I just wanted to get the picture out there. So, yep, you know, yep. visualizing the right things. Okay, so um, so this is uh, the goals of robustness. So let me also kind of circle this in red because we make, uh, we'll, we'll come back to it um, in just a little bit. 
And let me talk a little bit about before I um, kind of get to this, uh, the, you know, before I, I get to the main part, let me talk a little bit about uh, non-parametric methods, right? So which is what we'll mostly be talking about today. So uh, examples of non-parametric methods are, you know, things like um, K-nearest neighbors, decision trees, random forests, things like this. And uh, the reason why, you know, I kind of picked, uh, we, we picked them to work on is because there's a lot of beautiful theory on these non-parametric methods. A lot is known and they have some very nice properties. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and a lot is known in statistical learning theory for a very long time. Uh, you know, this, this Cover and Hart, and, you know, it, there's a long line of work following, you know, Cover and Hart, there's a lot of work by Lugosi um, that looks at these kinds of classifiers, and there are very nice and clean and general characterizations available. Okay, so, um, so how am I going to talk about these uh, non-parametric methods? So we will talk about a class of non-parametric methods that, sorry, that can be written as uh, weight functions. Okay, so what are weight functions? Weight functions are um, classifiers which look like the following. Suppose I have my training data S, right? So training data, you know, my training data S is, you know, X1, Y1, um, all the way up to Xn, Yn, okay? And uh, a weight function uh, will look like this. So I will have, so, and suppose I'm given an input X, right? So this is kind of, a, you know, uh, think of, about this as a test input. So you have some uh, input X. The weight function is you are going to have a weight WSI of X, right? This is the weight of, um, weight of, um, x due to xi, right, due to the point xi and training set s, right, uh, xi and training set s, and your total weight of x will look like this. This will be sum over uh, i going from 1 to n, um, yi times wsi of x, okay? Uh, and you will also have the constraint that sum over i going from one to n, wsi of x is equal to one. So for any x, think about these as uh, kind of weights assigned to x. And your final weight is something like this. Ws of x is sum over the labeled combination of the weights. And your classifier will output, your classifier will simply output uh, just the sign. So remember, we are talking about binary classifier, right? So these are, uh, you know, your labels are plus one or minus one. So what you will do is you will I simply output the sign of ws of x, okay? So, uh, you know, it seems a little bit abstract, but why is this uh, interesting? Well, this is interesting because a lot of classifiers fall into this framework. So for example, if you're doing k nearest neighbors, right? What you are going to, uh, the way you can um, look at them is you can say WSI of X is one over K if XI is a K nearest neighbor of X, right? Uh, and this is going to be zero otherwise, right? So what you are doing over here is you are taking the majority of the labels of the K nearest neighbors, right? Decision trees will also fall into this framework. So decision trees, what happens is, you know, you have, um, you know, various rule rules and then uh, decision trees will induce a partition of your uh, instance space, right? So your decision trees would be, you know, maybe this was the rule, um, you know, so I'm just drawing like an arbitrary decision tree. So decision trees will induce the partition, a partition of the space. And here your WSI of X would be, so if your X falls into, let's just say this cell, right? And let's say there were 
Nx uh, training points in the cell, then Wsi of x would be one over n sub x, where n sub x is the number of uh, n sub x is number of training points in the same cell as, um, as uh, points in the same cell uh, as x. Right. And, uh, you know, so now uh, and, and you know, it's not just KNN on decision trees, but a whole bunch of other things will fall into this framework. Right. So uh, it's a very general framework. And uh, what is known about this framework? Uh, yeah, sorry, so can, I, I, can I just ask another question? I mean, this framework is, is as you defined it, it's so general it, it encompasses any function. Uh, because, right, right, I mean, you, you allow the weights to depend on X. And so I, I can just you know, for any, you give me any function and for any X, I'll look at whether the function outputs one or minus one, and then I'll set the weight, I'll put the weight entirely on an example that's one or minus one accordingly. Uh, you could. Um, so I think you, you need, you must need some other constraints on the weights. I mean, in the examples you gave, the, I mean, the constraints, ha the weights have a particular form. I, I mean, uh, yeah. it's different, so the it weight different for every to, X, but. Right, the weights have to sum to one. Yeah, but that's I, I can I can just put all the weight on one on one item and zero everywhere else, because you allow the weights to depend on the input x. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, what is known about these functions depends on some properties of the weights. So if the weights satisfy okay, okay. certain properties, then these are okay. good ideas. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Um, so what is known about these weight functions? Well, uh, before that, I will give you one last definition, and then I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell you about what's known about these weight functions. And this last definition is that of the Bayes optimal. Okay, the Bayes optimal classifier. And the Bayes optimal classifier is the classifier that is the most accurate classifier on your data distribution. Right. So most accurate on uh, on D, okay, and um, and what does this classifier look uh, look like? Well, um, you know uh, the classifier will kind of look like this. So I'm going to call it G star. So G star X will predict one if uh, the probability under D of the label Y equal to one given X is greater than or equal to half, and it will predict minus one otherwise, right? So as you can see, this is kind of a, you know, it's kind of an idealized classifier, right? It's something one can aspire to, but it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something to aspire to, but it's not something that you will get, right? Out of any finite number of samples. And, uh, and that is what, but uh, a lot of these results um, kind of, uh, you know, talk about, right? So that, that's what a lot of these results uh, uh, kind of talk about is when you converge to this Bayes optimal classifier in the large sample limit, okay? And uh, so now I will finally tell you what is known about these non-parametric methods. And uh, so th there's a lot of stuff that's known. Um, I'm going to, today I'm going to talk about a theorem by um, Stone from 1977. And um, and believe it or not, this is, uh, you know, before uh, I was born, let alone my students. So this is the Stone uh, 1977 theorem. And the reason why I'll talk about that is because it's a very elegant kind of uh, thing, right? I, I, only if I have a question. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I'm not familiar with this field. So this might be a, not a very good question. But if you go scroll back to your previous slide, uh -huh. here, the G star of X, the base optimal. Right. Uh, the, you start with an X and the Y is the one that's paired to it or which, what is the Y, what a half? Uh, so, so excellent. I should have probably uh, specified that. So your D is a joint distribution on X and Ys oh, and no. you could factorize it into the marginal over Xs times the conditional distribution, right? So given X, you can have, um, you know, you, you can have this conditional distribution, PY equal to one given X and, uh, you know, PY equal to minus one given X. Sure. So the thing is, for a given x, this condition that the condition the, the conditional probability being bigger than 0.5 yeah. is for which y? Any y? No, for y is drawn from this joint distribution. Okay. If if there exists one, is that is that what you mean? Uh, I mean there so, would there be a joint distribution on x cross y. Right. And so this condition could be satisfied for many y's for a given x. Right. 
It depends on the distribution. Uh, so here we are talking about binary labels. So for an X, you would have some probability that that X is one. Given the X, you have some probability under this distribution that that X is one and some probability that it's minus one. Uh -huh. okay. All right, okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is an advantage of classification where everything is discrete. So that part is very nice and uh, uh, and well behaved. Okay, so uh, so what does Stone's theorem say? Uh, Stone's theorem put some conditions on uh, you know as one of you guys pointed out, uh, Stone's theorem put some conditions on these weight functions so that they converge to the base, uh, you know, so that their accuracy converge to the, converges to the accuracy of the base optimal classifier in the large sample limit. And here are the conditions, okay? So the first condition is um, there, you know, and the first condition is basically a regular uh, regularity style condition. So there exists a constant C such that, for all non-negative measurable f with expectation of f of x less than infinity. Uh, this is kind of a, yeah, this one is a bit of a technical condition. So the expectations, all expectations are over D. Um, sum over I going from one to N, W S I of X times F of X I um, is less than equal to C uh, expectation of F of X. So this is a bit of a technical condition. Okay, the second and the third are more interesting. The second condition says that for all A greater than zero, the limit N tends to infinity, uh, the expectation of sum over I going from one to N, W S I of X, um, this is the indicator function of, um, you know, remember there was this distance metric x minus xi less than equal to a is equal to zero, right? So what is this saying? So what this is saying is that, remember the weights have to sum up to one. So what this is saying is that on an average, the effect of the contribution to your total weight. So if you take an X and you look at its total weight, well, the contribution, uh, sorry, this should be greater than, um, the contribution to this total weight from points that are far away is zero, right? So this is your X. This is your ball of radius A around X, okay? So all the points that contribute to W, of x, w s of x, from outside this ball, that will go to zero in the limit. So what is happening is that the classifier is getting more and more local in the limit, right? And you know, k nearest neighbor, for example, has this property, right? So um, you know, your classifier gets more and more local as you draw more and more samples from the data distribution. Uh, your ne nearest neighbors get closer and closer, right? So, uh, so that's, that, is, uh, that is an interesting property. And then the third property is also an interesting one, which says that limit n tends to infinity, right? Expectation on expectation. So this expectation is over, you know, S and X, both, uh, both S and X, uh, both drawn from the data distribution. Um, the maximum of I going from one to N, sorry, uh, one uh, less than equal to I, less than equal to N, W S I of X. So this maximum weight will also go to zero, right? And this, for example, will happen. Uh, this you need when your data distribution, when your classes are overlapping. You don't need it when your classes are, uh, you know, when they're far apart. You only need it when your classes uh, can be overlapping. And uh, so what this means is that the maximum contribution for, uh, so if you have your X and uh, let's say you have your X over here, and if you have your XI, right? 
uh, if you have a particular Xi, the maximum contribution uh, of Xi to the total weight of a particular X, well, that maximum contribution will just get smaller and smaller, right? And uh, so, you know, if for k nearest neighbors, if your k goes to infinity as uh, n goes to infinity, this will happen, right? Uh, and uh, so what does this mean? So, you know, what is the intuition behind this condition? The intuition, so what does this condition give you? Well, what it gives you is that it helps you smooth over noise, right? So imagine you have, uh, you know, so, uh, so when is this helpful? Well, imagine you have an X, right? And these are, uh, you know, your uh, nearest neighbors of X. Well, if K grows to infinity, and let's say the nearest neighbors, you know, with probability 60% uh, their label is plus and with probability 40% their label is minus, right? As the number of nearest neighbor grows, at some point your majority would be the right sign, right? So that's kind of what you are getting out of this, right? Eventually, as your number of nearest neighbors grows, you are smoothing, you know, you're getting more and more smoothing over the noise, right? And so eventually uh, you're, you're going to win over the noise, basically. This is kind of what this uh, condition gives you, right? Intuitively, this is what this condition means, okay? Uh, and uh, so what uh, uh, Stone showed is that if this sort of, you know, if these three conditions hold, then W is uh, this kind of weight functions is what is called uh, base consistent. And what does base consistency mean? I'm going to, uh, um, again, uh, quickly write down the definition, but, you know, it's just the sort of things that you would um, expect. So what this means is that um, this is, uh, something is uh, base consistent um, if uh, if the following holds if for any uh, data distribution d epsilon and delta right there exists n such that for uh, training data size greater than or equal to n with probability greater than or equal to 1 minus delta over um, your training data drawn from D to the N, uh, what you have is the accuracy over D of uh, M is an algorithm, right? Um, is a training algorithm, right? M of S greater than or equal to accuracy uh, over D of G star. Remember G star was the base optimal classifier minus epsilon, right? So remember this was the base opt. Okay, so what this means is that as your training data size grows uh, with higher and higher probability, uh, as your size of the training data set grows for, you know, doesn't matter what the distribution is, with higher and higher probability, you are going to get, uh, uh, you know, your accuracy is going to get closer and closer to the accuracy of the base optimal. Right. And again, um, this might, you know, the end that you need for different distributions might be different. And in fact, it is different. Right. Some distributions we all know are easier than others. But this is uh, this is kind of what base consistency means. OK, so this is what was known. Uh, this is what was shown by Stone in 1977. And people have also built on it. They have, you know, uh, they have done a bit of uh, a lot of other stuff. There are rates and, you know, all kinds of other things. But this is kind of uh, where we will start today. Okay. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to switch back to robustness. Uh, any questions about this so far? Yes, sir. So uh, the, the distribution D, mm -hmm. does it have any special characteristics or is it any dist joint distribution on X cross uh, Y? So it can be... Um, Because everything is, 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 even the robustness will depend on the nature of the distribution D, right? Yes. Are yes. there some that are preferable to others? What what characteristics do we would we like the distribution to have? Right. So, um, so for consistency, for this kind of asymptotic consistency, that always holds. Mm -hmm. Different, uh, the rates are different for different distributions. Right. And, uh, and then the rates also differ. Um, they also depend on the classifier. So for k-nearest neighbor, the rates are, uh, you know, you get a different set of rates than you would for kernel classifiers, than you would for decision trees. 
Um, and so maybe I can answer this question for K-nearest neighbors. So for K-nearest neighbor, the rates depend on um, basically what the um, effective boundary between the distributions look like. So, you know, distributions, um, you know, where there's a, so for example, distributions where um, PY equal to one given X is too close to half. So these are highly noisy distributions. Those distribution convergence is slower. Uh, then there are uh, things like, you know, distributions whose um, plus minus boundaries are very, you know, um, so, so these kinds of, you know, distributions, right? So here the plus minus boundary is kind of, you know, they're, they're close and they're, they're very kind of non-smooth. Those distributions convergence is slower. Um, uh, for these kinds of cases, unfortunately, you know, unlike like linear classification, there isn't any one kind of thing like D over square root 10. There, there isn't a thing like this. The, these are uh, very much dependent on distribution properties. And in fact, um, there is a very cute theorem by Lugosi where uh, he can show that, you know, I mean, if you give him like a bad rate, he can find a distribution where that bad rate would happen. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So let me then switch to uh, robustness. Okay. So what can we say for robustness in this context? So what I will do is first I will talk about for robustness. First I will talk about um, what uh, we'll, we'll call well separated data. Okay. Uh, and it turns out for robustness, a particular measure of separation becomes kind of interesting. And that, that measure is what we call R separation. And I'll also tell you about what happens in the general case, but it's just that it's a lot more complicated than, um, you know, what happens in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in, in this R separate case. So that's why I want to talk about it first. Okay. Uh, and the proofs are also much simpler for the R separated case. Okay. So a distribution D is R separated. It, sorry, R separated. Uh, you know, it's said to be R separated um, if the following happens. So if you draw uh, and x, y, two pairs, x, y, and x prime, y prime, right? So if you draw x, y from D and x prime, y prime, right? So if we draw these two pairs from D, okay? And if you find that y is not equal to y prime, then x and x prime are going to be distance to r apart. Okay, going to be distance at least twice r apart. Right. So the way to think about this thing is, uh, you know, imagine, um, you know, again, this is kind of the picture that I was uh, trying to draw earlier. Right. So let's say this is the support of the pluses, you know, and it could be kind of a complicated support. So there are these, you know, there are maybe maybe there are several, um, you know, maybe there are several clusters of cats. Right. So, you know, um, you know, cats uh, like this and, you know, there may be several clusters of cats and then, uh, you know, there are uh, maybe uh, some clusters of dogs. So this is a kind of dogs. This is a kind of dog. So my point is that these distributions could look really complicated, right? But uh, any cat is at least twice our, away from any dog, right? So that is our separation. And um, uh, why, why are we interested in our separation, right? The reason why we are interested in our separation is that our separation means implies there exists some f with astuteness one, right? So that the astuteness of f with respect to the distribution d and r, this is equal to one. So this is kind of, you know, if you are familiar with, um, you know, other kinds of learning theory, this is kind of analogous. It's not quite the same thing, but it's analogous to the realizable case, right? There at least exists a perfectly robust and accurate, you know, there ex at least exists a perfectly astute classifier. Now, whether we can find it or not is a different matter, but it, there at least is, uh, you know, it's at least achievable, right? So there exists a perfectly astute classifier, okay? Okay, 
So fine. So what we will do now is, uh, you know, uh, until the very end, now we will talk about our separated distributions. Right. So, um, OK, so our separated distributions and we'll try to prove an analog of Stone's theorem for this kind of our separated distributions. OK, so OK, so now the question is, what should we now converge to? Right. Because remember, before we were converging to the base optimal and but the base optimal is kind of undefined outside the support of the distributions. Right. So to give you an example, um, maybe I'm going to draw it in pink. So, you know, this could be kind of, a, you know, this uh, pink curves could be kind of a base optimal. Uh, maybe something that kind of. Um, you know, so this pink curve is, uh, sorry, uh, this pink curve, I'm just trying to make sure it's just, you know, it, it classifies something correctly. Um, yeah, something like this. Um, yeah, may, sorry. So maybe there is this little clump. Right, so this pink curve is a base optimal. You can also have other base optimals, but the thing with this um, base optimal is that it passes very close to this distribution, right? So as you can, sorry, let me maybe try to blow it up a little bit more so people can see, uh, you know, it will pass very close. Uh, sorry, let me close my door. because it's uh, My neighbor, um, yeah, my neighbor is gardening. Um, so, uh, so if you look at this very closely, so what is happening over here is that, um, you know, if you blow this up, then at these points, you are passing, the base optimal is passing very close to these, uh, you know, to, to these, um, you know, to, to these uh, clusters. And so even though there exists a classifier that is, um, you know, the, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is perfectly astute, uh, the base optimal may not be it because there are many base optima and, you know, they may not be it, right? So we need uh, a limit, which is a little bit different. And we come up with such a thing and we call it the R optimal, right? So R optimal, you know, just as we have base optimal is the classifier that maximizes accuracy. We have the notion of an R optimal, which is a limit object, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something we can aspire to. So the R optimal is the classifier with maximum astuteness. So this is a maximally, uh, maximally astute classifier. And, uh, you know, this um, was kind of, uh, this particular concept was introduced in a paper we uh, wrote last year, um, uh, you know, with my student, the Avian, um, um, the IT actually an ITA postdoc, Cyrus Rastation, and um, my student, Vision Wang. So the R optimal is the maximally astute classifier. Right. And so what, what would we, uh, what would the R optimal look like? So let me maybe write down what it looks like for an R separated distribution. Again, notice that the R optimal is also not unique. Unlike, you know, just like the base optimal, the R optimal is also not unique. But uh, let me, uh, let me write down what it looks like. So, uh, so I'm just going to call it G star R. Um, so G star R of X is, this is again A, R optimal. Question. Uh, so the R separation condition, uh, is it like a high probability condition or do we want this condition to hold uh, deterministic? So this is a deterministic condition. Uh, actually, I had a similar question to Soel. This is a deterministic condition. Right. Uh, first, I thought it was also a probability condition, but if it's determined, what kind of a distribution D enable, what, what is the property of a distribution D which would permit this? Is there a characterization of such Ds? Uh, so this is the definition and, and what would be a property, a defining, uh, not a defining property, a structural property of such a distribution on the product space, which enables this? Because it's a strong condition, right? It is a pretty strong condition. Uh, you know, uh, that's again, a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. Characterizing this sort of stuff, it's a very good question. 
one thing I can tell you is that we did a bunch of measurements. Uh, again, you can't, uh, you know, get distributional properties. And I think actually, by the way, relaxing some of these results to high probability conditions is also actually a very good open question. We haven't looked at it because this is all very new. It's all, you know, from 2020, but maybe in 2021. But uh, so, uh, but uh, it's a very, uh, but one thing that we can say is that we did a bit of measurements on, you know, the adversarial example data sets that people do experiment with, right? Like MNIST and Cypher. And we found that they're all R separated, at least, you know, in empirically, the training and test data are uh, R separated. And uh, for values of R, which are actually quite a bit larger than what people use for these adversarial example experiments. Yeah, you, you see, if such a property were to hold, uh, again, I, I, I my guess would be that the conditional distribution of y given x should be sort of peaky, right? Because it can't be spread yes. out. And yes. so it won't be spread out. Yeah. And so there must be some way to characterize this, at least in terms of the conditional distribution of y given x, which is where yeah. I think the property will have its protein. Right. So conditional distribution of y given x, right. It has to be, I guess, entropy zero, right? Because... Um, entropy zero, right. But, but those and, are specific, right? And yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, the X's also have to be, the supports of the X's have to be some yeah. distance apart, yeah. yeah. So Kamalika, the observation you have on uh, CIFAR and MS, it is quite fascinating, in fact, if they are, uh, are separable. Uh, so one question I have there is that like, say if I pick two labels, uh, two samples from different labels and I measure their separability, okay. how does it compare if I pick two samples from the same label? For example, again, an excellent question. So, okay. So if two samples from the same label were always closer than two samples from different labels, the nearest neighbor would work perfectly, right? So that doesn't happen. But on an average, samples from the same label are closer than samples from different labels. I see, I see. And so we found that as well. Um, I, actually, can I make a comment maybe about this question? I, I think um, if you go back to your example from the beginning of the talk about classifying cats and dogs, uh -huh. Then I think that uh, you don't have to scroll back, but but the point is that that's an example of a, such a distribution because you expect that cat pictures and dog pictures that occur in practice are actually far apart, right? Yeah. So, but 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 so maybe that answers Prakash's question a little bit. But but my observation was going to be that this doesn't do anything for the attack that you were talking about to motivate the work, right? Because uh, a panda with a little bit of noise ha has probability zero under the true distribution D but it doesn't prevent an attacker from giving you a point from that distribution. Sorry, not from any distribution. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent an attacker from adding noise to a panda, right? And then getting- Right, it doesn't by... prevent the attacker. I mean, the attacks don't have to come from the data distribution. No, no, right, right. So I'm just wondering about the usefulness of the definition to prevent those kind of attacks. No, so the definition of astuteness says that for the data, for legitimate cats, everything in a ball of radius R around the legitimate cats should be classified as a cat. So everything in a ball of radius R around the legitimate oh, panda should I be classified see. as a panda. Yeah. I, I see, okay, so, what, so you would actually, I mean, if you had, uh, yeah, I see. So the astuteness would prevent that attack. Yes. I see. I should have discovered that case, yeah. Yeah, I know this part is, uh, it's, it's slightly confusing because one part is for all and one part is, you know, we are mixing for all and probabilities, but uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay, uh, so, okay. So coming back to, and again, uh, let me warn you that this is a R optimal. I mean, there are, uh, there could be many R optimal. So let's say you have an R separated distribution. So this is what uh, a particular R optimal might look like. And let's say you are doing binary classification. So G star uh, R of X would be plus one if, uh, the distance between X and the support of the uh, pluses is less than or equal to R, and it would be uh, minus one otherwise, right? So this could be an example of what the um, what the R optimal looks like, but there could be other R optima as well, right? Um, you know, there could be multiple R optima. And if your distribution is particularly well separated, there would be quite a few R optima in the middle, right? So imagine, um, you know, imagine if your uh, cats, these are your cats and, you know, uh, these are your dogs, then, you know, they're uh, depending on R, all these things could be all R optima. Right, so there could be like a whole bunch of R optima in the middle, even if there are separated, right? 
so this is uh, you know so this is this uh, you know so this is the r optimal so now we have a uh, now we have the right limit object to talk about right now we have the right thing to converge to and uh, so now what we are going to do is um, what should be our notion of consistency so again we are going to define this notion of um, our consistency which is essentially what uh, what we are doing is we are defining uh, what it means to converge to the r optimal and uh, again, you know, following base consistency, we are going to say that an algorithm M is R consistent uh, if for um, any, uh, you know, distribution, uh, you know, is, uh, is data distribution D, uh, you know, parameters epsilon delta, these are all parameters greater than zero, and in zero less than gamma, sorry, my gammas and Rs look very similar, less than R, there exists an N such that for N greater than equal to N with probability uh, greater than equal to one minus delta over the training data, right? S drawn from D to the N, uh, the astuteness of D R, this is this is an R minus gamma. This is a gamma, right? Uh, of the algorithm, uh, calcul uh, you know uh, that takes S as the training uh, as the training data is greater than equal to the astuteness of D uh, and R G star uh, G star of R. Right, this was our most asteroid classifier minus epsilon. Okay, so this is kind of what you would expect, but I just want to point out uh, one thing that is a little bit different is that there is this extra parameter gamma, right? So remember how we had with high probability, probability one minus delta, what the training said, our, um, you know, uh, in case of accuracy, you had pr a probability one minus delta over the training set. Our accuracy was the accuracy of the base optimal minus epsilon, right? There was an epsilon and a delta. Now we have an epsilon and a delta and a gamma, which is less than R. Um, where, uh, you know, you are, again, you are converging in astuteness, but, you know, you are, your radius is also converging to R, right? So that's, uh, that's the notion of R consistency, okay? And uh, finally, um, uh, here is uh, our theorem. Um, so maybe uh, I can uh, kind of state our theorem. And this is the theorem for, uh, so this is a theorem uh, with my student, uh, Robi Bhattacharji. So, um, and we uh, had this in a paper in ICML. So this is for um, R separated distribution, right? So this particular theorem only applies to R separated distributions. Uh, R separated distribution uh, D, Okay, and suppose you have a weight function W, uh, so R separated distribution D, uh, suppose the following condition holds, suppose it holds that for, for any zero less than A less than B, uh, what we have is the following. So let me write down this condition and it'll only make sense when I contrast it a little bit with stones, right? So um, limit n tends to infinity, okay? Uh, expectation, and this is expectation over S and also X, right? Um, supremum of X prime in a ball of radius A around X, uh, then you have sum of i going from 1 to n, um, w s i of x prime, uh, the indicator that x i minus x prime uh, greater than b, Right, this entire expectation is, uh, you know, the in limit n tends to infinity. This expectation goes to zero. Uh, if this is the case, then uh, W is R consistent. Okay. So maybe let me try to bring this in contrast with Stone's theorem. Right.
right? So maybe let me scroll back to Stone's theorem. So, um, so for Stone's theorem, if we are looking at the R consistent case, then these two are, uh, if you try to prove Stone's theorem, then you don't need these two, right? Uh, these two conditions, you don't really need one and three, right? So one is kind of a technical condition, which you need when the noise rates could be different from, you know, for different Xs. And uh, three is the thing that says that the contribution to X from each Xi, uh, you know, is not that much, or at least as n goes to zero, that contributions gets less and less. So, so you can smooth over the noise. So here's there's no noise really. So you don't really need number three. You don't need uh, number um, one. So what you need is in fact number two, right? So um, for in this case, the relevant thing is number two. And maybe let me see if I can. I know there's some way of cutting this. So maybe or uh, copying this or dragging this particular thing. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can manage that here now. Okay, let me see if I can drag this. Uh, okay. Okay, never mind. Let me let me maybe then try to um, yeah let let me try to maybe rewrite the condition since I can't uh, seem to be able to drag it. Um, right. So the condition looked like the following. So Stone's theorem. Oh, sorry. Stone's condition would be for all um, a uh, you know greater than zero limit uh, n tends to infinity expectation over s and x um, sum over i going from one to n w s i x the indicator of um, x i minus x prime uh, greater than b sorry greater than greater than a so we have only uh, one constant a over here um, greater than a uh, is equal to zero right so uh, so so as you can see that uh, you know so this is a locality condition right if you remember what this is saying is if you have a particular x and you have this ball around uh, around x then the contribution from uh, you know the x size that lie outside that ball uh, to the particular weight of x that contribution actually gets smaller and smaller right so the classifier actually just gets more and more local it's just focused on points that are right around x okay what we have over here is a slightly stronger condition than that. What And the way it's stronger is through this term, right? This term that I'm highlighting. So what this says is that's not only the case that for X that are drawn from the data distribution, but it's also the case for, um, you know, things that are in some ball around it. Right. It's it's also the case for, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's also the case for uh, points that are in some ball around it. Uh, this condition should also hold. Right. So the way to think about it is, you know, you have your X here, you have your ball of radius A around X, and then you have like a bigger ball of radius B and, you know, both X and A and B, it has to hold for all A and B that go all the way up to R. So this is our ball of radius A, and then this is our ball of radius B. And basically, this should hold for every X prime that lies in the ball of radius A, its contribution to, uh, you know, a ball of radius B, sorry, it's the ball of radius B is around X prime. Uh, this contribution from outside that ball is going to uh, go to zero, right? So, so basically, the classifier is local. Uh, you know, again, the intuition is that the classifier gets local and local, but now this is in a uh, stronger sense than what was required by Stone. Okay. And um, uh, so before I get to a proof, I was hoping to do a little bit of a proof if we have time. Uh, and the proofs are really very simple, which is really why I chose this uh, piece of work. Um, but before we get to that, uh, let me tell you about, I want to tell you a little bit about what does this mean, right? So remember how we talked about, you know, how uh, K-nearest neighbor was uh, consistent. So Stone's theorem said that, you know, k -nearest nearest neighbor was base consistent. So what kind of, what uh, will satisfy our theorem? So it turns out that there are some things that satisfy our theorem. And in fact, the first uh, such thing is K nearest neighbors. Okay. 
provided uh, you set k in a way that, so I'm going to call it k sub n because k could change with n. And what you need is k sub n over n goes to zero, right? And intuitively, um, you know, this is clear. I mean, if k sub n over n goes to zero, what that means is that the classifier gets more and more local, right? Um, and this was, you know, this was a condition of uh, Stone's theorem as well. Um, you know, for uh, let's just say uh, separated distributions for uh, for Stone's theorem, this would also hold. Well, uh, when k sub n over n went to zero, the classifier got more and more local, and it would be base consistent if the, the uh, you know if the pluses and minuses were well separated, were separated, and that is also true for our theorem. Uh, another thing that's true for our theorem, uh, it also applies to. Uh, what are called, uh, you know, kernel classifiers. These are slightly different from, you know, SVM kernels. So kernel classifiers are uh, weight functions where which look like this. So um, where W S I of X would look like the following. This would be uh, K of K is a function um, of something like this. So this is used in stats quite a bit. Uh, divided by h, uh, h is what is called a bandwidth parameter. So this is divided by h, divided by sum over i going from one to n, k of um, x minus, uh, actually j going from one to n, k of x minus xj divided by h. Okay, um, and k here could be, you know, so k of t, so this is, uh, you know, an example of k would be something like this, right? So this is the Gaussian kernel. There are other kernels as well, Gaussian kernels, Laplace kernels, and various others. So this is the kind of thing that's used in STAT quite a bit. And kernel classifiers, uh, so what was known about kernel classifiers is that if this h depends on n, right? So the bandwidth parameter depends on n. So if uh, what happened was that, um, uh, if h sub n goes to zero uh, as n goes to infinity, what would happen is that this classifier will also get more and more local, right? The focus will be on points that are close. And if that happened, then, uh, you know, Stone's theorem would have been satisfied in the well-separated case. Uh, we also need one more condition. So for us, what we need is if this holds and if for any c greater than one, um, the following holds. So limit x tends to infinity, k of c times x divided by k of x um, is equal to zero, right? So uh, so what does this mean? So this means that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a technical condition, but what this means is that the kernel uh, will, um, uh, you know, it will increase or it, it, or it will decrease faster than a polynomial, right? So, um, you know, so, so this will be satisfied by, for example, the Gaussian kernel, right? Because it will it will decrease faster than a polynomial, right? So if these two conditions hold, then these kernel classifiers will also satisfy our theorem, right? So this brings us to the interesting question of what doesn't satisfy our theorem. And it turns out there are things that satisfy Stone's theorem, but not ours, okay? And I'll give a simple example, you know, just to give you guys some sense of what is happening. And uh, what are those things? So let me give you an example. So the example is histogram. I, uh, one quick question concerning yeah. Stone's theorem and your theorem. Can we just scroll up a little bit, please? Yes. So in Stone's theorem, I see x as the random quantity is the anchor, right? So a, yes. this x here. Now, in your theorem, you have this ball around x, and then the statement is being made for all the weights are on the x primes. Right. Now, would it make a difference to put the weight on the x rather than the x prime? It would, actually. It would. Uh, so that is where the strength, uh, you know, that is why it's stronger. The condition is stronger in the sense that not only you want good things to happen for X, but you also want it to happen for thing in a ball around X. All right. Thank you. So, yeah. 
So then, uh, so the interesting bit is that there are things where our theorem, uh, you know, where, um, in fact, not only does our theorem not, uh, not only is our theorem not satisfied, but also they are not robust, even though, uh, or, or, or rather, they don't converge to the R optimal, even though they would have converged to the base optimal. Right, so there are algorithms like that, and I'll give a very simple example. Uh, and this is something called histograms, right? And basically, this is you know think about it as like a simplified form of a decision tree. I won't go into decision trees because in decision trees the partitioning, because of some technical reasons, right? For decision trees, what happens is the partitioning often depend on the labels, but in Stone's theorem, the partitioning uh, has to kind of depend on only the excess. So there's some technical reasons why this doesn't apply to all manner of decision trees. There are some decision trees where this is not the case, and then this uh, things would apply. But you know, just to keep things simple, I'll talk about histograms. So um, in histograms are, um, you know, these are essentially um, kind of uh, things that people use in stats. And uh, what you do is, you know, you have your data points, right? And what you would do is, let's say your data points, you know, you just have points on a line and some of them are, um, you know, so some of, uh, sorry, some of them are, uh, you know, some of them are orange, um, right? And then, uh, you know, you have clumps of orange and some of them are green. Um, and what you would do is you would split until you get to a cell that is completely pure, right? So you start out by saying, okay, I will do this. Um, and now, you know, so these are my two cells and within each cell, I'm going to classify, um, you know, within each cell, I'm going to predict the majority, right? Then what happens is if your cells are impure, you will keep splitting. So here, you know, so th this is how we would split. Then maybe, uh, you know, you split by half. So maybe this is what you do. Uh, things are still going to be uh, impure. So you can, uh, so this cell doesn't need to be split because it's pure. These you would still end up splitting. Um, you know, and so on. And then this is what you would end up with, right? And then when a test point comes, you check what cell it falls into, and then you predict the label of that cell, right? So that is your histogram. Um, and uh, the thing is that histograms are, uh, you know, they are not going to converge, they are optimal. Why is that? Let me give you a simple 2D example, which will make the point clear, right? Suppose these are my cats. And these are my dogs. Those are my cats and those are my dogs. And if you look, uh, sorry, maybe I drew things, uh, you know, maybe, okay, let me make things a little bit simpler for myself, just uh, for my drawing, right? So let's say these are my dogs. And these are two are separated, right? So these are two are separated. But if I try to use this algorithm for drawing histograms, what I would do is I would just find, so now we want to draw 2D histograms, so we have 2D cells. So I'm just going to find this one, right? This is my, um, you know, this is, these are my two cells. So these were the, so let's say this was kind of the, the boundary. So sorry, uh, my drawing is not the best. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's say this was kind of the instant space. And, uh, you know, these were the boundaries. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up finding these two cells, right? Here, I'm going to predict yellow. Uh, this is yellow. And here, I'm going to predict green. And I would be done, right? And this is a base optimal, right? I converge to a base optimal. This is perfect. You know, even if I get an infinite amount of data, I'm not going to change my rule because I'll be predicting, you know, yellow here, green here. I'll be perfectly accurate. But this is not really robust, OK? So uh, histograms, in fact, are not going to converge to the R optimal. Here, there is a histogram, you know, which you can imagine, right? If you had your cell boundaries go, like if you had a lot of cells, and if your cell boundaries kind of went zigzag like this, uh, there is such a thing. You could construct it, just that the existing algorithms for constructing histograms uh, are not going to do that, right? So what we need are new algorithms with a focus on this kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so that's an example. Again, uh, so you know, this is what makes things a little bit interesting. Is that these are some? So this is an example where uh, you would converge to the base optimal as uh, n goes to infinity, and you know, you would be perfectly accurate. 
But even if your distribution is R separated, you would not converge to the R optimal, right? And you would end up with this thing where, you know, you're perfectly accurate, but you're not robust, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, you know, so this is uh, something that we can show, okay? Any questions at this point? It's fine. Clear. Yeah. Okay, so since I have uh, maybe about 15 minutes left, maybe I think what I will do is uh, maybe I'll tell you a little bit more because uh, I don't think the proof can be covered in, I mean, the proof is pretty simple. It's like, um, uh, but I don't think it can be covered in 15 minutes. So maybe what I could do is I could tell you a bit more about the general case. because there can, were, I, can I ask you a simple question? Yeah, yeah, of course. How do you check the R separate this condition from real data? That is a very good question. You can't really check distributional R separateness, right? Because it's always possible that there's a very, very rare cat which looks like a dog and, you know, it's in the distribution. So and what, fact, happens, what happens if you cannot check the condition, but you have from empirical data some estimate of R separateness? Can you do anything with that? So what that tells you uh, is that um, these rare things are not, like the rare things that uh, conflict with our separation, they are just not in your test set, right? That's, okay, that's can you reformulate everything in the context of probabilities of correct classification, probabilities of incorrect classification, and try to do the problem that way, rather than uh, the way you've done it? Because in that case, you will be able to carry along estimates of the R separateness uh, in your estimates of the probability of error. You know, that's a very good question. We haven't looked at that. Okay. You know, that's that's an excellent question. Yes. Uh, okay. right. You know, Thank we haven't you. thought about that much, but you are absolutely right. If we can do something verifiable, you know, then that, that might be like, you know, based on some validation data, that might be a very nice way to go. Thank uh, thanks. That's a very nice. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very nice question. Thank you. Uh, hi, I, the, Kamalika, but your definition of separate, separatedness had this probability delta built into it, right? Um, let me see. The R separation. Delta no, it, uh, no. The... Okay, sorry. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you yeah. can't play around with that. I thought maybe to answer John's question, we could play around with a threshold probability, but it's not there. That's fine. No, it's not there. And you are right. That's actually a very kind of whole. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a very good open question. Yes, there, there are many, many, many open questions. Uh, it's it's very new and uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so okay, so that was uh, you know the, the particular case, and maybe let me tell you guys a little bit since there's been some questions on it. So maybe let me tell you guys a little bit about the general case. Okay, so in the general case, you know what could happen is you know our separation doesn't hold anymore, and you know um, maybe let me just try to draw something just to keep your. Um, uh, you know, so our separation doesn't hold anymore. And, you know, you have cats. Uh, maybe you, you can also have uh, everything like works if you have uh, multiple classes and, you know, maybe your cats and dogs are overlapping. I don't know if you guys have seen, by the way, the hardest um, classification problem is ca classifying Chihuahua versus Muffin, right? So imagine you are in that set where, uh, you know, you have these images of Chihuahuas which look exactly like muffins. Even I can't tell them apart. So, you know, let's say if you are in that problem and, uh, you know, and then maybe this is, uh, you know, this is one of these things. And then, uh, uh, yeah, so maybe, you know, there's uh, cats and dogs and, you know, chihuahuas and muffins. And then there's, uh, there's a bit of overlap and things like that. So now, uh, what, what can we do? Right. So let's first start out by trying to look at what would our R optimal look like, right? And uh, here is uh, what it uh, what it could look like. Um, it could look like the following. So suppose I am now trying to kind of uh, re-characterize uh, the R optimal. Now suppose 
and let's say I know the, you know, I know the data distribution, right? So the R optimal, it's really an uh, aspirational object, you know, like the base optimal. So it's okay to know the data distribution. So let's say I know the data distribution D and I'm trying to uh, talk about what the R optimal will look like, right? Suppose uh, SI is a subset, uh, is a set of our instance space. So, you know, we have this instance space, uh, which is a space of vectors, right? It's, it's like a vector space X. So suppose um, S sub I is our set of, uh, you know, or subset of the instance space. Um, so, or, or sorry, set of instances, um, right? Where, we are going to predict i, right? So where, or when I say v, I mean the R optimal, right? When we are going to predict, uh, you know, label i uh, and uh, b, um, and we are going to predict label i and b robust, right? So over this entire set S sub i, we are going to predict label i and we are going to be robust in that set, right? So in the sense that for our distance uh, r around that set, we are still going to keep predicting i, right? So then if S i uh, is such a set, then for i not equal to g, what has to happen is that the distance between S i and S j has to be greater than or equal to twice R, right? Otherwise, you know, if this was your SI and this was your SJ, and if you were to predict the same thing, right? These balls would just overlap, right? If they were closer then these balls would intersect and, you know, for the points in the middle, you wouldn't, you know, you would have contradictions, right? So for I not equal to G, the distance between SI and SJ should be greater than or equal to twice R. Okay, and uh, now, so, you know, this is fine. So this is our size, this is a constraint. And now what are we, if, if, since we want to maximize the astuteness of the classifier, what should we maximize? Well, what we want to maximize is the accuracy in these sets, right? SI and SJ, right? So what is this accuracy? Well, the accuracy is the fraction of times when we draw from uh, D, our label comes out to be I, uh, since we are always predicting i in SI, the accuracy is the fraction of times in this SI when we draw a label from the distribution and that comes out to be i, right? And uh, that is essentially, you know, um, it looks a little complicated, but this is, this is what it is, right? Integration of x in SI, py equal to i given x, that's under the data distribution d, times mu of x dx, right? And here, if you remember, our d was a joint distribution over x and y, and the marginal over the x's was mu, right? And then the con you had this conditional of y equal to something given x, right? And this is this is also discrete, right? This is a discrete, because the labels y are discrete, so this, this is kind of a nice well-behaved discrete distribution, right? So this is the uh, accuracy uh, on SI, right? And now what we could do is the following. We could, uh, you know, uh, get what our R optimal looks like by solving an optimization problem, right? So now our optimization problem looks like this. You maximize, right? Sum over I equal to one to K. So if you have K classes, so K is our number of classes, right? Um, integral of x in SI, probability y equal to i given x times mu of x uh, dx, right? And SI are subsets of the instance space conditioned on, sub, sorry, subject to d of, uh, sorry, the distance between SI and SJ, uh, greater than or equal to twice R, right? So this is the distance according to this metric that we were given earlier, right? And once you solve these optimization problems, I mean, imagining you could do that, you would have your SIs and SJs, right? You would have your SIs and SJs. Your prediction rule is the following. So your prediction rule is to uh, predict I if uh, the distance between um, X and SI 
is less than or equal to R, right? So prediction rule, you know, you're given an input X. So this is like, uh, you know, in the test case, you're given an input X. So you're going to predict the label I if the distance between X and SI is at most R. So basically in this area, you're going to predict this label I, right? And if your X falls outside the union of all these areas, then, you know, then you could predict whatever and that's fine, right? You would be, you would still be uh, as astute as possible, okay? So this is our R optimal. Okay. So, okay, so that's fine. Now the question is, what can we do with this, right? So, um, and again, there's, you know, of course, there might be a lot of things we could do with it. But one of the first things we thought of was to say, uh, what is a good finite sample? Uh, approximation to this, right? So like, you know, in Bayes optimal, when people, uh, you know, when statisticians looked at the Bayes optimal, well, a finite sample approximation to the Bayes optimal is that you estimate PY equal to one given X uh, by looking at some of the local points and then based on whether the, uh, that estimate is greater than uh, half or uh, or not, you can predict uh, the right, uh, you, you predict a label, right? And that's essentially, you know, that's essentially non-parametric regression, right? So that's kind of um, what the statisticians came up with. So now our question again is that what is an analog of the, you know, what is an analog as finite sample approximation? And, you know, again, this is something that we came up with. And again, there's many, many open questions. Uh, I, I'm not sure this is the best one, but it's one. Uh, so what we will do now to come up with a finite sample approximation is we will approximate. So SIs are, you know, regions, right? So what we will do is we will approximate the SIs now with a set of uh, training samples, SI with a set of training samples, right? And now what this comes down to is if we want to find these SIs, if you squint at it for a while, what you would realize is that your union of SIs, right? So sum over I, SI, right? And this doesn't have to cover the entire set of training samples, just as the SIs, you know, they don't have to cover the entire space, right? Sum over, uh, union over I, SI is the largest subset of training samples of uh, S, this is our training data, such that points with different labels are distance twice R or more apart. Okay. And so this uh, immediately suggests an algorithm, which is you find this subset, right? You find the largest subset of the training set so that points with different labels are distance two R or more apart. And then you build, uh, you know, one of uh, your algorithms that you know has good properties, right? So then you talk about nearest neighbors or you talk about kernel classifiers, you know that these have good properties um, and, uh, you know, and you just, uh, you know, and you just build them, but you do them on this kind of uh, subset of the training set instead of the entire training set, right? And uh, this is something that we call um, adversarial pruning. Uh, and again, this is from, you know, uh, so there is a very popular algorithm in neural networks, um, adversarial examples called adversarial training. So this is kind of, a, you know, a counterpart to that. And uh, this was, uh, again, this is uh, in our uh, last year's AI stats paper with my student Yao Yan, um, ITA postdoc Cyrus, uh, Yijian, um, and myself. And, um, and there what we did was, um, you know, there what we did was we tried out this algorithm and it seemed to work reasonably well on a lot of, uh, you know, so we tried out adversarial pruning plus nearest neighbor, adversarial pruning plus kernels. This, this, uh, sorry, we didn't do kernels, nearest neighbor, decision trees and a few. And, you know, it seemed to work reasonably well. And then in uh, a later paper, we, uh, we ended up proving this, uh, the following theorem. Uh, again, this is an asymptotic theorem uh, that if you do adversarial pruning, plus nearest neighbors or kernel methods, right? Then the result would be um, R consistent, right? So in the general case, uh, the general case 
consistent. The general case, the conditions are a little bit more complicated. So I, um, you know, and kind of uh, explaining them is also not super, uh, you know, it's, it's much less intuitive, so I won't go into it. But if you do adversarial pruning, followed by your favorite algorithms like nearest neighbor or kernels, then, uh, then at least in the large sample limit, you would get consistency. Okay, so uh, at this point, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very enjoyable talk. Thank you. Uh, let's open the air for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Kamalika. Really, really uh, nice talk and great results. Uh, so one question I had is that I feel you're, most of the results you presented, they are pretty general in terms of the metric that you're mm -hmm. using. So uh, can we use, instead of like L2, in the pixel space, for example, can you use a, a metric like L2 in an embed, embedding space that you compute? And then in maybe in the embedding space, the um, you know, distances among uh, samples from the same label would be smaller than samples from, from a different label. Now that is quite plausible, but then you know the solution would be uh, to find those embedding spaces. So one is to find those embedding spaces, and then you know uh, use one of these algorithms in the embedded spaces. Uh, that that would be actually quite nice. And then the robustness though would be with respect to that same metric, right? Oh, you can't have robustness with respect to the original metric. I see. I see. That's that's actually super interesting. Um, uh, we actually looked into like some LPIPs embeddings and uh, empirically we have shown if you have some robustness with respect to that metric, mm -hmm. it actually provides generalizable robustness against L2, L infinity, other metrics. So it may not be uh, bad to define robustness, adversarial robustness, not only in terms of the L2 in pixel space, but maybe with respect to some uh, embedding. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Thankfully, I mean, the theory is it's it's very general. So for the theory uh, theory purposes, it, it would be fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kamalika, I have a question. This this part about the adversarial pruning. Can you say a little more about it? I. I... So uh, I guess so. What you would be doing is uh, you would find the maximal subset of your training samples so that points with uh, training points with different labels are distance two r or more apart, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and the way you know this is you know one just finite sample approximation. Uh, the reason why it's motivated is because we are imagining if these sets SIs instead of being you know subregions, they were just some sets of training samples. So this, it's a finite sample approximation. Um, and the way you could do this is actually, um, when you have two labels, it becomes, um, you know, you can think of a, a graph where every node is a training sample and two nodes are connected by an edge. If these are samples with different labels, but are closer than two, two are, right? And now you want some sort of independent set in the graph, maximal independent set in the graph. So it, it, tacit, uh, implicitly, there's some fiddling around with the distribution D, or it is completely separate from that? Because the, the distributions had that assumption, right? Their separability, that these things should be two out of five. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So here we are talking about a completely general case where there's okay. no assumption. This is completely general. Yeah, so if you did that, then your data, you won't need to do any adversarial pruning. Okay. More questions? Well, Kamalika, thank you very much for a most enjoyable talk. And uh, for me, this was uh, a nice learning experience. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you.